Hello. First of all, I want to thank, you, thank the uh, Virginia Commonwealth Center for Excellence in Autism for inviting me to do this webinar. I have to tell you that they do tremendous work, and you all are very blessed to have the leadership of Carol Shaw and others in your state. I also want to thank, before I present, the entire team from the Indiana Resource Center for Autism, because clearly none of us do this alone. And they, I benefit daily from their wisdom and knowledge. So um, through the years, um, I have been involved in autism for probably 30 plus years. And when I first got involved in autism, the incidence of autism was one in 10,000. Today, the incidence is one in 110, according to the Centers for, for Disease Control. In Indiana, what we know is that the incidence is closer to one in 90. So this disability that used to be very rare is becoming much more common, and every school is seeing this increasing incidence. In addition to the increasing incidence of autism, we're also seeing a changing face of autism, is that many of the students that we see come to us with many more complex issues and comorbid conditions. So it is very typical to see a student who not only has autism, but also has attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, learning disabilities, uh, anxiety is a major one for our folks, and I think much of our programming is about how to really alleviate and diminish that anxiety. And we see kids that um, start displaying some of the characteristics that look very familiar um, with um, bipolar. So we're seeing more kids, and we're seeing kids who are coming to us with more complex challenges. And what that means is that it puts tremendous stress on our system of how to effectively educate uh, these students. So um, some of the issues in education, um, there's a lot of conversation about what are evidence-based practices. I think it's pretty clear that autism has become a business. All that you have to do is do a search on autism and treatments, and you'll see a lot of different approaches come up. And I think it's very hard for families to understand and know exactly what they should be looking for in a treatment, exactly what people should be doing in terms of, of educating these students so that we see long-term outcomes. And the advocacy of autism has become an incredible business as well. So there's a lot of discussion at the national level about exactly what is evidence-based practices. And, um, and, but before I start that, I want to focus on one aspect of this, and this is a theme that I want to hit on a few times. Um, my concern is, and I really believe, that we are being successful with students, not if um, they meet certain academic standards or if they meet certain test scores, but I think that we have to be very concerned in the autism community about long-term outcomes. The unemployment rate for individuals on the autism spectrum and those with other disabilities as well is as high as 80 percent. And so whatever we choose, I think that we have to be very thoughtful about what are we preparing individuals for. So as we look at evidence-based practices, um, we were very fortunate in this country to have the establishment of the National Professional Development Center on Autism Spectrum Disorders. It was an OSEP-funded grant that involved multiple states, including the Mind Institute in California, the Waisman Center in Wisconsin, and the Frank Porter Graham Center in North Carolina, who we worked with through Sam Odom and Ann Cox. And what happened in our state, we were one of the first states to be focused on for this grant. What happened in, with us is, is that we received training in evidence-based practices and we also were able to create some demonstration sites in our state where we would go into a school and we would select students that we would look at what are the outcomes we hope to achieve and how did we apply evidence-based practices. We have now um, taken that project up to uh, another 12 sit, uh, schools in our state and are really working on implementing evidence-based practice. And I have to tell you that probably out of all the, the activities that my center does, it's one of the activities that my staff is most excited about. There's also um, web and, uh, a website that has um, modules that are available through the A modules, OCALI, the Ohio Center for Autism and Low Incidence, and you can access these also on the um, IRCA website as well. One of the issues with the evidence-based practices are the fidelity of implementation. So let me explain that in, in common language. A lot of times I will go into classes and people will say, oh yeah, we use visual supports all the time. The kids have visual supports and they have schedules and they have things that tell them what's going to happen next. And yet when I go into the classroom, I don't see those schedules. I don't see those visual supports. And then people stop using them because they say that they're not working. 
Well, when you look at fidelity of implementation, what you're really focused on is to make sure that not only are those practices are being done, but they are doing, being done according to what research tells us is how they should be done. And that's what fidelity of implementation is about. So I'm not going to go through all these. I'm just going to list these, and you can take a quick look. I am going to discuss some of these evidence-based practices today and in the next session. Um, but I want you to understand that if you go to the website, there is a list of these evidence-based practices that also, um, and along with that, there is the research behind them, and there is also a fidelity implementation checklist that tell you step by step how to do these. So again, I'll be going through some of these evidence-based practices today, not all of them, but I'll be giving you a sense of some of these. So you see things like functional behavioral assessment, peer-mediated instruction, um, picture exchange communication system, and again, you'll see the research behind them. And in the next session, I'll be talking about some of the social skills and some of the language communication programming that is looked at as evidence-based practices. So before, again, before we really look at these evidence-based practices, whether a student is in general education setting, special education setting, wherever they are, I think before we choose a process, we really have to think about an outcome. And that's a cautionary note because I see what happens in the field of autism is, is that we choose processes. Let's do PECS, let's do ABA, let's do TEACH, let's do whatever. Instead of thinking, first of all, what is it that we want a child to be able to do? And really knowing the child, understanding the child. So before we have a conversation about the process, people have to be clear about the outcome. What is it that we want the child to be able to do as a result of our programming? And then we choose a process based on that. So let me talk about some of these processes. But before I do, um, I'm called in, honestly, I spend a lot of time in schools. And when I get called into schools, the question is um, usually around wanting to fix a student. And it's typically because of a behavior. And what I want you to understand is that while there are individual supports that we need to put into place for kids, students exist in a culture and exist in a school culture. So many of the strategies that we look at implementing, we also look at universal design, not only doing those for students on the autism spectrum, but doing them for other students as well. So for example, when, you, when I go in and lo I look at working on behalf of a student with autism, I look at the school-wide discipline practices. Is discipline a major issue? I look at um, the leadership role of the principal, and does the principal have play a strong leadership role? So I want you to understand that it's not just about looking at a child, but you can't, and I, and I use this term very cautiously, you can't fix a child in a system that is broken. So part of the work is going into schools and looking at how can we help kids be successful in schools and also lift the school culture up as well as part of that. So again, it's not probably not surprising to any of you that the me main reason I get called is because of the presence of challenging behaviors. And I'm not going to talk a lot about challenging behaviors, but I want to frame the conversation in terms of challenging behaviors. And these behaviors can range from withdrawal to refusal to self-injurious behavior to property destruction to anything that places kids at risk in a, in a classroom or in a school setting can, can be considered a challenging behavior. So if you'll notice, when we looked at the evidence-based practices, one of the evidence-based practices is functional behavioral assessment. That's also part of law. It is part of law that when a student has a history of challenging behavior that hinders their learning or the learning of others, that there's a process called a functional behavioral assessment process. It is lovely that this became part of law. It is also in some ways unfortunate that it became part of law. Because when it became part of law, and I'm not suggesting we pull it out of the law, but when it became part of law, all of a sudden people start talking about the form. Who fills out the form? What color is the form? Well, how many pages is the form? How many days do we have to do the form? And I want you to understand that functional behavioral assessment is not a form. It is a process. I think about it much like a medical testing. I have a, a family member right now who's in the hospital. And when she was, she went into the hospital with symptoms. And as she went into the hospital with symptoms, what the doctors do is that they run tests to figure out what is the underlying cause that is creating these symptoms to occur. 
That's very much what functional behavioral assessment is about, is identifying the underlying causes that are causing the symptoms that we see come out behaviorally. So we use a format called um, a hypothesis behavior pathway. And again, I'm just going to walk you through this very quickly. The problem behavior for this child is, is that they grab toys and they hit peers with the toy if they resist. The trigger for it, the immediate antecedent, what we know will happen right before the behavior is that the child sees a peer playing with a the toy they want. The setting event are those things that you may or may not see. They may be things like getting up in the morning and not having the right kind of breakfast, or not sleeping the night before, or being, getting sick, or um, having allergies, or changes in the home, or changes in staffing. These are things that can set kids up for having problematic behavior. So for this child, the setting event is, is that they have never had the opportunity to play with other children. The consequence is about what is the payoff? What is the child getting from it? And that's what we have to look at is, is when individuals engage in a behavior, whether it makes sense to us or not, they get some kind of a payoff. There's something they're getting from it. And we have to figure that out. And so for this little boy, what he gets to do is that he gets to play with a toy, he gets a very brief interaction with a peer, and then he gets teacher attention. And so often when we are looking at behavior programming, what happens is, is that people focus on the consequence. How do we deliver a punishment, a punitive approach, or how do we do something so that the child no longer does the behavior? In truth, a successful behavior support plan requires not that we so much diminish the behavior or not that we solely diminish the behavior, but that we teach an alternative behavior, that the child learns to do something differently. So in this case, because this child has never had the opportunity to play with other kids, the skill he has to learn is how to play with others, how to ask to share toys. And until that skill is learned, you can expect that behaviors will continue to reoccur. So as we look at the skills that we're going to teach students, there are strategies that we start using. Probably one of the most powerful strategies that we use with kids is reinforcement. And truly, if you understand reinforcement, you really have a handle on some things that can really benefit behaviors. And understanding reinforcement from the child's perspective, what the individual gets or escapes from do by doing the behavior, these are things that maintain our behavior over time. A comedian tells a joke and will tell the joke again if that joke gets laughter. If it doesn't, they'll stop telling that joke. So reinforcement for all of us keeps our behavior going. And what we have to realize is that we intentionally or unintentionally can reinforce behavior all the time. And we have to be very careful about our behavior. For example, um, I've inherited two grandchildren in my life. And when my grandson, who is three, runs around a restaurant, if, if people look at him and tell him how cute he is, what that does is that reinforces him to continue to run around the restaurant. It doesn't really help our situation at all. So you have to understand it from the individual's perspective what they're getting from the behavior. So reinforcers have to be individually determined. And just so that you understand, the only definition of reinforcement is that it increases behavior. The only definition of punishment is that it decreases behavior. And just so that you also understand is that many of these strategies are also represented in the field of applied behavior analysis. So the rules for reinforcement is that they have to be individually determined. So for example, M&Ms are not reinforcing for everyone. Um, some individuals are reinforced by time away. Some individuals are reinforced by a sensory activity. Some individuals are reinforced by attention. But you have to understand what, that, what they are individually reinforced by. For students with autism, they oftentimes tell us what's reinforcing. And they tell us by looking at their fixations. What are those things that are really highly interesting for them? But obviously, you really base whether something is reinforcing or not by whether it changes behavior. So the rule of reinforcement is, is that when you're teaching a new behavior, you reinforce a lot. When you are trying to sustain a behavior, what you do is that you, uh, you do intermittent reinforcement. So maybe the third time the child does something, you reinforce. Maybe the second time, maybe the fourth time, but you still have reinforcement available. Again, c continual reinforcement is powerful for building new skills. Intermittent reinforcement is really strong for maintaining behaviors. And if you doubt that, go to Las Vegas. 
Las Vegas is the perfect example of intermittent reinforcement. Every time you put your money down, you don't win, but you do enough to keep that behavior strengthened. It must directly follow the behavior, and you have to also specifically state why a behavior is being reinforced. Instead of just saying, good job, say, nice job of sitting at your desk, nice job of following directions, nice job of turning to that page. So there's a lot of different ways that we can identify reinforcers. There are checklists. We can interview people. We can observe the child. We can, again, look at their fixations. The primary reinforcers include things that are edible and, and sensory. Secondary includes tangible privilege or activity. And then the generalized conditioned reinforcers are things that we oftentimes use in schools, which are tokens or stickers or something that children can exchange for another reinforcer. With reinforcers, you want to be careful not to use it too much um, because if you use too much, you go through satiation. And what that means is that the reinforcer just loses effectiveness. So if you've ever been around somebody who tells you continually, good job, good job, good job, after a while, that good job starts losing its effectiveness. So you want to be very specific. There are also You have to also make sure that you have some novel reinforcers. And this will really help. And reinforcers that are really um, very high quality can make a difference. We have found for a lot of kids that being able to work on iPads has become an incredible reinforcer for them. So variable schedules, and let me explain the difference between variable and fixed. For example, if on every Friday you are, have a pop quiz, um, and kids know every Friday morning there is going to be a pop quiz, what will happen is, is that with a fixed schedule is that students will take the quiz and then for the next few days after that, after the weekend, you'll see that their effort will diminish. And then as the next Friday starts to approach, what you will see is that their performance will increase. Okay? With variable schedules, what you will see is that if you sometimes do the quiz on Tuesday, sometimes on Thursday, sometimes on Friday, what you will see is that students will respond at a steadier rate, okay, and that it will be harder to extinguish also this behavior for the individual. I'm only going to talk about a few of these, but differential reinforcement is a very powerful type of reinforcement, and it really is data-based. I think it requires us to also consider uh, the rules around shaping, um, and shaping just means that you reinforce successive approximations towards a desired goal. But with differential reinforcement, what you do is that you look at um, how a child is performing, and then you look at gradually trying to either increase or decrease the behavior, the responding. So let me give you an example of this. Just last week, I went to see a little girl who refused to drink out of a cup. Very bright. She will be successful in general education. She does not want to drink out of a cup. It is very challenging for her. So what happens is, is that when she's given a cup and it's, if it's full of juice, she will tip it and oftentimes she gets juice all over her. So one of the things that I recommended to them is put a little bit of juice in there, prompt her to drink that, and then as she does, gradually increase the amount of juice in it. And that's what differential reinforcement is about, is just gradually increasing what, what you do with kids. Um, Differential reinforcement of incompatible behavior or alternative behaviors. This is reinforcing behaviors that are not possible with the problematic behavior. So, for example, it's not possible to walk around a cafeteria and eat at a table at the same time. If you want to teach an alternative behavior, the alternative behavior, rather than just speaking out in class, is that you reinforce them every time they raise their hand. So you have a student with autism who screams out in class at various times. You prompt them, and you catch them being good. And if they re raise their hand even once, or even begin to raise it, then you reinforce heavily. Praise and feedback, and, and um, I don't know that, that um, specifically this is listed as an evidence-based practice. Um, having been in the field for a lot of years, though, I think that this is an evidence-based practice. I think the rapport you establish with students is really critical. I think that if students know that you really like them and that you really have their best, best interest at heart, that they will work harder for you. I think that's true for all of us. And so as you give praise, again, give it immediately, give frequently, but not so much so that you satiate. It has to be very sincere. 
And um, it, it should also um, be very specific. And I think um, one of the ways that we look at this, and, and I, as I'm working with teachers, I will actually tell them to take data on their own behavior. And something that we have seen in the research is that if your positives outweigh your negatives, five, eight to one, seven to one, nine to one, um, what you will see is that there's a more positive culture in the classroom and overall fewer behavior problems. So just as an invitation for all of you, sometime while you're in your classroom, for just a period of time, mark down how many times you say good job, how many times you give positive constructive instruction, how many times you, on the other hand, say no or you, or you are punitive with a student. And overall, your positives should outweigh your negatives, eight to one, nine to one, seven to one. Extinction occurs where we withhold reinforcement. So, um, and what happens is, is that um, um, when you first withhold reinforcement, you, what you will see is that the child will work harder to try to get whatever it is that you're withholding from them. So a really common one is for students who are driven by attention. If you know for a student that a payoff is attention, they really want attention, and you ignore that attention, what will happen is, is that they will increase their efforts to get your attention until you may not be able to resist. So, so from a behavioral perspective, if you've decided I'm going to ignore this child and their efforts at getting my attention, and the child persists and they persist and they get louder and they get more aggressive and they get firmer about it and they wave their arms stronger and you finally give in, what you've taught that child is in order to get my attention, I have to up the ante. I have to increase my behavior. So, but it's not something that you should use with dangerous behaviors. And you, and you also need to be careful in this that you combine with other procedures that um, you have to get everybody engaged in this process because if one person, while you're trying to extinguish a behavior and you're ignoring that individual's attempts at getting reinforcement, if one individual gives in, what happens is, is that in many ways you've now intermittently reinforced and that is harder than to withhold. Prompts, as we're looking at prompts, typically people will look at prompts as a hierarchy. So we know, for example, that individuals who we believe that individuals who can follow verbal prompts are the most sophisticated and, you know, modeling and visual and, and so on down to physical prompts. But instead of it, what you have to think of is, is that there's no universal kind of prompt hierarchy. I am very much of a visual learner. I um, um, make lists to make lists. Don't read things to me. Let me read them myself. And so for me, the most successful way to prompt me is through visuals. Also, you have to realize is that we learn different things in different ways, using different kinds of prompts. So um, for those of you who have watched um, uh, Dancing with the Stars, for example, um, you can watch Dancing with the Stars. You can um, try to model Dancing with the Star Stars. But what you learn from watching Dancing with the Stars is that they need physical prompts to be able to do those dancers, okay? And that doesn't mean that they're less sophisticated. It just means that different kinds of prompts work differently in different situations. What we have to be careful, though, is with these kids is not to create prompt dependency. So you'll see students, for example, who may have an instructional assistant who is closely attached to them. And the assistant tells them to do something, and then they become very prompt dependent on that assistant telling them what to do next. And that's a real caution is, is that we not make kids prompt, prompt dependent. Time delay is that what we do is that we work with kids to keep them engaged longer. So we can use timers, we can use other strategies to kind of increase the amount of time that they stay engaged. And again, use visual supports, things that help them to understand the expectations, to know that yes, you did three time, things this time, but next time we need you to do four before you get re your reinforcer. Task analysis is um, something that we all do and, uh, and in different ways. A task analysis just means that we look at an activity and we think about the steps that are involved. And, and we do this by observing people doing the task, by consulting with experts, by performing the task ourselves. And once we've identified the steps in that task, what we also then do is that we use chaining procedures backward where we start out with the last step. So for example, if you're going to teach a child to put on a coat, the last step is zipping up the coat. You do that first so that the child understands the power of it. 
forward chaining is, is that you teach the first step until they have mastery. And total task, which I think is one of the best, which is that you train the entire task, you have them go through all the steps, and then you build in support in those steps where they have more difficulty. The other way that you can use task analysis is, and that we do is, is that we will go into environments and we will look at all the complexities of an environment. For example, think about um, going into a school cafeteria and all the tasks that are required of that, being able to order food, um, being able to go to your desk, being able to socialize with other students, not taking food off of other people's tray, open, opening milk, communicating, paying, making choices. So understanding everything that's required in a, a task that we may consider really common and helping students then to be able to go through that entire step. Behavioral momentum happens, and we again do all of this, do this, is when you are trying to get a child to do something that they've never done before. That maybe is a more complex task, and they're not sure that they have the skills to be able to do the task. And so what we do is that we deliver um, three or four tasks or skills that are highly preferred that we know that they can do and then when they have successfully done those tasks when we have created that momentum then we interject a task that is more complex and then with choice I mean with support we help them to be able to do that task. Choice making is um, um, I think is you know one of the things that that we know in life is that um, kids have to be able to make choices. You know, I, I am doing this webinar at VCU and, and professors and faculty will tell you that students who, especially their freshman year, who come here and haven't really been taught how to make good choices, really sometimes flounder. And I think choice making is one of those things that we have to help all kids to be able to do. Um, and students with autism, clearly it's something that we have to think about with them. And so as you're thinking about choice making, there's some things that are just common sense rules. One is, is that if something isn't a choice, don't frame it as a choice. If it's, uh, for example, I will hear teachers say to kids, so are you ready to do your work now? No, not really. Okay? It's not a choice whether you do your work or not. So make sure that when you ask kids questions, that they are really questions that you're ready to get the answers back on. So. Um, and then make sure that the choices are really available for students. You know, I've seen situations where kids are given choices of snacks or food in the cafeteria, and then those choices aren't available. And realize that that may set a child up. So when you're first uh, teaching an individual choice making, you know, identify those things that are really preferred and those things that are not preferred, and give them the choice of two of two options. And then whatever they choose, that's what they get. Um, and, but present choices throughout the day. Um, and, and let me give you an example of this. In one of our schools, we had a student who um, um, had a hard time sitting in the school cafeteria because it was really loud. And so once he was done eating, the rule in the cafeteria was everybody has to stay in the cafeteria until the bell rings. Um, unfortunately, if he had to sit there in that, all that noise, once he was done eating, he would have some behavior incidents. So a very wise principal came in and said, you know, this isn't working. He has a behavioral outburst, and then oftentimes it's very difficult for us to get him to his next class. And he was in general education, very bright, but he couldn't deal with all the noise and all the commotion of the cafeteria. So what they did is that they gave him the choice of he could either stay in the cafeteria or else he could go to the library. He, they did not punish him. They gave him a choice. And when he went to the library, he was able to help with shelving books. He helped be able to check books out to help students find books. And he was seen in a very different and positive light. And over time, because kids saw him differently, there were times where he would choose to stay in the cafeteria. Now, an important thing that you also have to understand of this is that some folks looked at the principal and said, that's not fair because the other students can't go into the, into the library when they want to leave the cafeteria. Fairness is not about doing the same thing with every student. It's about making accommodations and leveling the playing field. And that's what this principal was doing, was helping that student do everything they could do to be the most successful. I don't wear glasses. Maybe I would consider it's not fair that some of you do wear glasses. However, wearing glasses levels the playing field for you.
So think about how you can build choice into the day because choice is an important one for all of your students to be able to learn. Shaping, and I talked about this a little bit, but again, this is reinforcing successive approximations, not expecting people to do things perfectly right away. Recently, I listened to David Copenhaver talk about um, teaching literacy, writing and reading skills. And it was interesting, um, and I know that there's a lot of philosophies about writing, but his philosophy about it was is that you have kids write a lot, read a lot, and that you don't demand perfection at first, but that you slowly reinforce them for doing better over time. For our students with autism who have tremendous anxiety, who many of them put a lot of pressure on themselves to do things perfectly, by reinforcing them for taking little steps in the right direction, that may alleviate some of that anxiety over time. Scheduling is, you know, provide students with schedules. They need visual supports. They need to understand what's going on. They may need to have alternative tasks available in case they get their work done in time. They're also with time reminders. And I think that the kids have to begin their time with you and end their time with you in a very positive way so that they're willing to come back again. Academic instruction and academic engagement is, is really uh, important for our folks. And I want to highlight a couple things on here. In the field of autism, we talk a lot about routines, how students with autism need predictability and routine. But one of the things that I know about, again, about life is that change will happen. And so if we always do the same things with kids every day, we're really setting them up for failure. So for example, one guy that I, one little guy that I worked with, when he was very young, his preschool teacher um, actually built a schedule for him every day. And every day in that schedule, there was something that changed, something that was different so that he got used to there being some lack of routine. And he's now um, entering eighth grade, doing very well in the general education setting. But because he was able to learn some flexibility, he is able to be much more successful. The predictability was that he always had a schedule. But within that schedule, there was always some change that was put into that schedule. So one of the other invitations that I will give you this year as you begin your school year, and I hope it's a great school year, is that you will look at your schedule. And I want you to look at your schedule and look at, um, and whether it's within the context of a class period or if it's a whole day, but look at how many minutes kids are there and then how many of those minutes kids are actually engaged in instruction. And what we know is that for all students, and not just students on the autism spectrum, but for all students, when they have too much downtime and unstructured time, that presents an opportunity for a behavioral outburst. So as you look at your schedule, what you should find is that about 80% of your day, kids are engaged in meaningful instruction. And that is an evidence-based practice in autism, in special education, and in general education. What it says, quite simply, refers to academic engagement as this is, um, simply is, is that the more time you spend teaching kids, the more they will learn, okay? So with kids, you want to make sure that you're getting them to respond frequently. You know, don't always call on the same students, but make sure that you're calling on a lot of different students. Um, maintain your pacing. Make sure that you're getting kids to really focus their attention on you. Part of this is, is also um, proximity or instructional control. And there are times where I will go into classrooms, and I have to tell you the kids are in control. Um, and one of the things that I have learned um, in working with students is, is that, and as I've seen teachers who are really successful, teachers who are really in control of their classroom, okay, they really have kids on task. They are multitasking there. They, and it, that doesn't mean that their classroom desks are all lined up in a certain way or that all the shelves are perfectly neat. It just means that that teacher knows everything that's going on in that classroom. It looks effortless, but it is masterful. And one of the things that it requires is that people cannot sit behind their desk. They cannot sit at their table. Instructional staff, instructional assistants, teaching staff have to get up and interact with kids. They have to engage kids. They have to be present. Okay. So if, for example, a student is talking and they're not supposed to be talking, one of the really effective instructional approaches is to go stand by them. That's called proximity control. Generalization. Students on the autism spectrum have an incredible difficulty with generalizing what they've learned. I remember meeting a man in Arizona who was studying for the CPA exam. 
And as he was studying for the exam, he actually asked if he could study for the exam in the room where he would be taking the test because he was not sure that he, could be, that he would be able to remember the information that he had practiced in his apartment in the, in the testing setting. And so he, by studying in that testing setting, he was able to retrieve the information much better. So if a child can only do one thing for one staff member and when a certain phrase is used, that doesn't mean that that skill is really learned. So for example, we ask a child with autism, um, what, where, what is your address? And we continually use it in that phrase. What is your address? What is your address? And they can say, tell us what their address is. But then one day somebody says to them, where do you live? And they say, house. So they've really not learned that whole concept of address and where you live and such. So make sure that a lot of people practice it, multiple people, multiple settings, use a lot of different kinds of examples, and that you reinforce intermittently. Ma maintenance means that you're going to teach something to mastery, and you rehearse a lot. For all of us, if we learn something, we don't practice it again and again, we lose it. You know, and we have to practice it in real settings. And I think that we also have to really teach authentic behaviors. And I think for all of us, you know, our goal as educators, whether whatever your label is, a general or special education teacher, is that all of our jobs is to make sure that lives ki that kids live enviable lives. And so within that, we have to think about what are really authentic behaviors that we have to teach to kids. What are authentic skills that we have to teach? Finally. Um, um, realize that these individuals will come to us with complex challenges. Realize that there is not a recipe or a cookbook. Every student will be very different. We have families in our state that have as many as five children on the autism spectrum in the family. What works for one child does not work for the other. What works for one child one day may not work for that child the next day. At the same time, I want you to understand that if you reflect back on the teachers who made a difference in your life and what were the qualities that they had, whether it was a sense of humor or passion or they had high expectations, that those qualities that we benefited from as students are also the qualities that students with autism will benefit from as well. If you enjoy your work, if you show these kids that you enjoy spending time with them, if you are very meaningful with your instruction, I think that you will be highly successful with these kids. Enjoy the work that you do. These are wonderful kids to get to know. Thank you.